Shaler Area High School graduate, and he studied neuroscience at the University of Pittsburgh. He also did his medical residency at AGH, and he is board certified in addiction medicine and emergency medicine, and he still lives here in Allegheny Cat. And he and his wife currently own and operate an addiction treatment facility, facility in our neighborhood Allison Park called Trinity Wellness Services. He's also launched a nonprofit organization called the Opiate Reform Initiative, which is dedicated to educating the public and empowering communities to fight the epidemic. His efforts with the nonprofit have resulted in more than 20 large scale opioid education summits over the last year. He's a regular contributor to KDKA, both radio and TV, the Tribune Review and is consulted frequently by peers and colleagues on topics related to opioid addiction. He's received a number of honors and awards for his work, including a proclamation award from Allegheny County. He and his wife have three children, and as a local family, they're dedicated to making the world a better place, starting right here in our community of Pine Ridgeland. With that, I'd like to introduce to all of you Dr. Tom Brophy. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I am Tom Brophy, I'm a physician. I actually grew up not far from here uh, in Shaler Township and I graduated from Shaler High School. I uh, had many friends from Pine Richland High School, um, some of whom are, are here tonight. And um, I appreciate everybody coming out. This is a topic that um, we all know it is a, affecting us as, as a community to a large degree. Um, and, and my goal here tonight um, I, I'm going to speak about the neurophysiology, about what's happening in the brain of, of an addict. And I hope that that helps everybody understand multiple things. Number one, um, what we're dealing with when we're trying to treat somebody who's struggling with opioid addiction. But also, um, just how you view addiction in general. And, and so I hope that we're able to do that. And then once I'm done speaking about those topics, um, my very dear friend Michelle Schwartzmeyer is going to get up and she's going to um, talk about something um, very close and personal to her, uh, which I think you, all, you will all also benefit from. So um, this is a, a question that I typically start with because it, it, we're going to come back to this question at the very end. And wh when I'm talking to students, I, I, I'll pull the crowd and kind of see where, where everybody answers. And it's usually 50-50, believe it or not. Uh, depending on, on the, uh, the crowd that I'm speaking to, when I'm talking to healthcare providers, it's usually a little bit more 70-30. Um, but whatever your answer to this question is, I just want you to log it internally, and, and, and then we'll come back to it after we go through the lecture. But it's a common question. Is addiction, is it a choice, or is it a disease? You know, just two days ago, uh, online, I saw people circulating an article you know, saying that it's, it's, it's a choice and that all the, the information that tells you that it's a disease is, is BS. The week before that, I saw an article stating the opposite. You know, and, and so whatever your answer is, I want you to log it and we'll see if we're able to uh, affect that, that um, answer as we go on. These are opioids. Now, I'm an ER physician, so I, I, I'm board certified in emergency medicine and I'm board certified in addiction medicine. Dealing with the opioid epidemic is something that I do every day, regardless of which setting I'm in. And we've really seen the opioid epidemic completely change the landscape of healthcare. You know, when, when I finished medical school back in 2005 and I started working in the ERs, we would see maybe one overdose a week. I now see one every few hours, and that's no exaggeration. And, and certainly some areas are worse than others, but every area in the country is being affected. I travel and work between Alabama, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. I have a lot of friends that travel on, out to the West Coast. We're all seeing this stuff. And we're gonna talk about why, why we still use it. But with this slide, I wanna just show you what the common opioids are. Up here at the top, you have your less potent opioids. Things like codeine, hydrocodone, oxycodone. These are the things that are in the medications that you're prescribed after a surgery or if you break a bone. You know, these are the, the components that are in Percocet and Norco and Lortab and Tylenol with codeine. 
Some of you, I'm sure, have taken these. Some of your children have taken these. As you work down the list here, you get into some things that are a little more potent. You see morphine, Demerol, Dilaudid. These are things that I, I use in the emergency department almost every shift. And you get down here into things like heroin, fentanyl, carfentanyl. Carfentanyl is the one that gets a lot of media attention, and it's an elephant tranquilizer. It's not used in humans, but fentanyl is used almost every day, especially in trauma ICUs and emergency departments. And what I want you to know is that most of these opioids come from the plant. You can see that the plant is kind of a beautiful plant, purple flower, a bulb in the middle. Inside that bulb is a glue-like substance that when you take it out and dry it, that's where opiates come from. And the term opiate and opioid, they're kind of interchangeable. Opiate, with a T-E at the end, is more of a medical term. Opioid is anything opiate related. The majority of opiates come from this plant, and they have for a long time. Even going back, you remember in middle school, you learned about the Chinese railroad workers and opium dens. This stuff has been around for centuries. But some of the opiates on this list, including fentanyl and carfentanil, including a couple of others like methadone, those are synthetic opiates. Those are not, you don't need the plant to make those opiates. They can be made in a lab. And that poses a whole new problem for law enforcement who's trying to prevent this stuff being shipped into the country because when a good chemist can make it in their basement, there's, there's no stopping it. There's no, there's no limit to where it can come from. This is just a picture to give you an idea of how potent this stuff is and also why drug dealers are gravitating towards things like fentanyl and carfentanil. If you have a very small compartment that you can smuggle drugs through, and these are all equal amounts as far as potency goes, you can see how much more bang for your buck you get with something like carfentanil. It literally is a single granule that is equivalent to that much heroin. This is why you've heard the, the news stories, you know, a, a police officer, um, right, there was one about a year ago where he just padded his vest and the, it was aerosolized, went into his nares, his nose, and he subsequently needed Narcan for resuscitation. This is why. It's because this stuff is so potent that even the smallest granule can cause somebody to overdose. So why do we use opioids? If it's causing such a, a drastic epidemic and it's causing more people to die every year than we lost in the entire Vietnam War, why are we still using it? The best answer that I can give you is that we don't have anything that's quite as potent for pain control in medicine. And it doesn't appear that there's anything coming down the pipeline that's going to be quite as potent. So if you come into the emergency department, you were just in a bad accident. You shattered your pelvis, you have a broken femur, maybe you have a broken neck. I can't give you Motrin and Tylenol and expect to control that pain. I can sedate you, I can put, make you unconscious, but if I want to keep you awake and actually control your pain, opioids are the best thing that we have to do that. They're the most potent painkillers we have, and they have been around for centuries. In addition to dulling pain and suppressing motor and respiratory function, they have some other side effects, things like itching, constipation, pupillary constriction, euphoria. Euphoria is the one that drives addiction. People feel euphoric when they take opioids. They feel good. And it, it affects different people differently. Some people will tell me that they feel energized. They get up, they can get, they can get all the things on their list done. Other people, it makes them feel like they're sinking into the couch, like a big hug, the best hug they've ever had. We're gonna talk about why they have those feelings. But these side effects, you know, if you've seen that commercial for opioid-induced constipation, has anybody seen that commercial? Most of you probably have, as a construction worker, and, and he's talking about opioid-induced constipation and the problem it's having. Well, if the pharmaceutical companies are willing to spend millions of dollars on a commercial for a side effect, that just tells you how many millions of people use opioids on a daily basis, prescribed or unprescribed. This is the classic toxidrome, and this is something that I was asked in my first week of medical school. The professor asked me to stand up, big auditorium like this, asked me what the classic toxidrome for opiates is. 
He didn't know that my brother happened to be an opiate addict. And so I was pretty familiar with this sort of thing. But this is the classic triad. Pinpoint pupils, decreased responsiveness, and decreased respirations. The pinpoint pupils is the giveaway. There's a lot of things in medicine that will cause what we call stupor, or, or, or medical stupor, or, or decreased responsiveness and decreased respirations. Somebody who comes in who's not breathing very well, who can't maintain their alertness very well. Head trauma will do that. Infection will do that. Stroke will do that. Hypoglycemia will do that. I can go on and on and on. There's not that many things that will give you pinpoint pupils. And an interesting story, you know, about a year ago, I was working in an emergency department down in West Virginia. And in, in classic kind of ER fashion, I'm at the nurse's station trying to, you know, balance a dozen different things. And out of the hallway to my left, I see a nurse running down, carrying a limp baby. And she's shouting, Dr. Brophy, Dr. Brophy, I need you in the resuscitation bay. So I see her carrying a limp baby. I put down what I'm doing and I go right into the resuscitation bay. And we're doing our normal thing. Unfortunately, this is something that we do encounter, not uncommonly. Checking the airway, checking the pulse, assisting with respirations, looking for trauma. I lift up the baby's eyelids and I saw pinpoint pupils. So I asked the nurse to give that baby Narcan. The nurse, she hesitated for about a half of a second, but we've worked together many times, she trusts me. She pushed the Narcan, the baby woke right up. So I stepped out into the hallway and I talked to the police officer that was there. He put mom and dad in handcuffs. He said, are you sure? Are you sure that it was opiates? Running through my head, I'm thinking, you know, there are some rare brain stem strokes that will give pinpoint pupils. There are a few other things that will cause that. They're very rare. None of them get better with Narcan. So yes, I'm sure. About an hour later, mom admits to giving the baby heroin. And as much as that makes you nauseated to hear that, and as much as that causes that visceral gut reaction, the big question is, why? And how does somebody navigate life normally for 30 years? Had a husband, had a job, had graduated high school, had gone to local community college, you know, by all standards was a normal functioning human being in the community. How did she get to the point where putting heroin into a baby was even an, an option? And, and that's what I'm hoping to teach you today as we go through this stuff. That's a pinpoint pupil. That's a pinpoint pupil versus the dilated pupil, which you can see. Dilated pupils, that's where you're thinking trauma, you're thinking aneurysm, you're thinking, you know, all, all those other things. But the pinpoint pupil is, is fairly specific to opiates. It tends to look more like this one down in the bottom right hand corner because you can notice that the eyes are droopy. The alertness is decreased, and so it fits into that toxidrome. And addicts will know this. High school students know this. They'll say, did you see John? His eyes were pinned. Yeah, he's messed up. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw Jenny at the, at the football game. Her eyes were pinned. Pinned is the, is the slang term for you know, pinpoint pupils. Understanding why addicts behave the way they do. Understanding why an addict will do something that, that you look at and just can't understand. It starts with this slide. This is your central nervous system, it's your brain and spinal cord. But can everybody see these green clusters? That's where opioids are having their strongest concentration and their strongest effect. And what I want you to notice is that right here, you don't see any cluster of green. Opioids are not working in this part of your brain. This is your prefrontal cortex. That's where all your rational thought comes from. Everything that sets you aside from primates comes from your prefrontal cortex. From an evolutionary perspective, it's the newest part of the brain. So if you're sitting here and you're thinking about what you want to get your child for their birthday, you're thinking about what you want to do when you leave here, you're thinking about you know, what career changes you want to make, you're thinking about long-term consequences versus short-term gains, all of those complex thoughts are coming from your prefrontal cortex. 
So what's this area where the opioids are having their effect? That's your limbic system. That's a much older part of the brain. It's the part of the brain that's responsible for your survival. It drives you towards the things that keep you and your species alive. Food, water, sex, and shelter. I call it the caveman part of the brain. There's some other nicknames for it. But what it basically does is through a system of pleasure, reward, and happiness, it drives you towards these basic functions. And if you don't have these things, if you don't have food, water, or nourishment, you don't have shelter or safety, you're not passing on your genes through procreation, and you don't, you don't last very long on this planet. Almost every organism on this planet embraces these things via some mechanism. So what happens when opioids take over that part of the brain? And I hate to use the word hijack, but you can see where the opioids are having their strongest concentration. This is the reason why you can't talk an addict out of doing drugs. This is the reason why it's impossible to understand that drive that's forcing them to do drugs or at least seek out drugs. And trust me, I've tried this my entire life sitting down with my brother, having that rational talk, sitting down with addicts, having that talk. Look at all the damage you're causing. Look at what you've done to your family. Look at what you've done to, to you, yourself, your life, your bank account, your job, go on and on and on. An addict in that moment will use their prefrontal cortex. They will register that conversation. They will say, I don't want to keep doing this. You're right, I hate what I've become. I have yet to meet an addict who likes being an addict. They all can register that in the moment, but when they walk out that door, they are being driven by the same things that are driving the rest of us towards food, water, sex, and shelter. Those are very powerful drives. They're very difficult to overcome. I'm gonna explain a little bit more about it. This is just another slide that basically says the same thing. The prefrontal cortex is where logic, analysis, all those complex thoughts come from, versus the limbic system, which is not only responsible for your survival, but it also has a very reactive, impulsive, and emotional connection. This slide, explains sort of the evolutionary development of the brain. The further back you go with the brain, the older that part of the brain. And this is very important when it comes to one part of the brain overpowering the next part of the brain. The best thing I can do is give you an example. So say you're sitting here and you're thinking about your career change. You're using your prefrontal cortex, you're thinking, using logic and analysis and all those complex thoughts. How is this gonna affect people around me? How's it gonna affect me? Your prefrontal cortex is very active at that moment. If I take away your food and water, once that hunger and thirst kicks in, you no longer think about your career change. You're now starving. That part of your brain takes over you stop thinking about things like career changes or what you want to buy your kid for their next birthday or where you want to go on vacation next year. The priority of survival kicks in and takes over. That limbic system trumps the prefrontal cortex. So say you're sitting there and you're very hungry and you're very thirsty, you haven't eaten in four or five days, you can't think about anything else but food and water. What if I then put a plastic bag over your head? This goes further back into the brain, into the brain stem, truly the thing that's keeping you alive. Responsible for your vital signs, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, breathing, oxygen, hunger, all those things. Well, if I put that bag over your head, you stop thinking about where you're gonna get food and water because this part of the brain is more powerful and evolutionary-wise, it's more primitive than this, this part of your brain. And likewise, does that make sense? This is the same reason why when you're sitting an addict down and you're having that conversation, if they're not sick in that moment, they will agree with everything you're saying. They will register that they don't want to continue down that pathway. But when they step out that door, 
and that drug is not in their system anymore two hours later, they are being driven by something that is incredibly powerful. This slide is talking about two neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine. I have a neuroscience background. I've always paid attention to this stuff because I was the guy with the addict brother, because I had so many friends who struggled with addiction. This stuff was always not only interesting to me, but important. I'm a physician, a business owner, my sister is a therapist, has a master's degree, and then there's my brother, you know, who was shooting heroin in his neck and squatting in an abandoned house. So I've always been that person to stand up and say, it's not a parenting failure. It's not the house you grew up in. It's not the neighborhood you grew up in. We had a lot of the same friends, a lot of the same social circles, a lot of the same experiences growing up. We'll talk about what does contribute to that a little bit later, but serotonin and dopamine, in neuroscience, we know that out of the dozens of neurotransmitters you have, and you do have dozens, they range from things like glutamate, GABA, nitrous oxide, serotonin and dopamine are the two that have to do with things that you enjoy. So if I went around this room and I asked every single person in here, what do you, what do you truly enjoy? What do you love doing? I might get a different answer from every single one of you, but I can tell you that whatever that activity is that you enjoy, it's being mediated by dopamine and serotonin. And we know this in medicine, when someone comes in or they're, they're, they're depressed, someone comes in, they're suicidal, someone comes in, they're just having a hard time grieving. We give medications that are designed to alter the dopamine and serotonin levels in their brain. Everybody's heard of things like Zoloft, Lexapro, Prozac, all those SSRIs, that stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. It's boosting the serotonin levels in your brain. There's several other medications that boost the dopamine levels in your brain. But what's happening with addiction, and opiates specifically, but several other chemicals as well, is when that opiate gets into the brain and gets into that limbic system we just talked about, they feel a huge surge of dopamine. And that surge of dopamine is unlike anything you can get naturally. You know, we like to, to pretend that that's not true. We like to say that, you know, to the heroin addict, like you can find other things that'll give you that same level of enjoyment. We have never found anything naturally that results in the same massive dopamine surge that you get with opioid use. So this becomes a problem, right? They're feeling that surge of dopamine in that limbic system, and even if in the prefrontal cortex they're saying, I don't want to do this anymore, their brain is remembering the last thing that gave the biggest dopamine surge. And this dopamine, it's designed to drive you towards positive things. You pick up your kid, you get a hug from your, your grandchild, you accomplish a goal at work, you get that raise, you get that, you know, you, the, the new vacation. All of those things are being mediated by dopamine. When the addict puts the opiate in, they're getting a surge of dopamine that is massive compared to all of those natural things. These are some alarming statistics. This one here should scare us all. When they look at adults in the age group of 18 to 24, one out of five men in that age group have abused an opiate in the past year. That means that they took it non-prescription from friend, family member, at a party, they're abusing it, they abused an opiate in some way. That's 20%. So even in the kids that are, are in you know, neighborhoods where they're not exposed to this stuff, they will. When they leave that school district, when they go out there in the real world, if 20% of people are doing something, it's gonna be very hard to avoid that in general. For women, it was one out of six, not that much better, right? But here's a terrifying statistic. For physicians who are prescribing opiates, this was just, this was a research paper that was published about eight months ago by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. They did research and found that anybody who takes an opiate for 30 days, including prescribed opiates, so if you broke your leg and I came in and it's, your femur shattered, it's, it's a bad injury, and I give you a 30-day prescription for Percocet, and you take it as prescribed, you don't take 
too many, you're not snorting pills, you're not doing anything other than taking it how it says on the prescription bottle. You will have a 36% chance of being an opiate addict for the rest of your life. And what's terrifying about this is that as physicians, we are just learning this. We're just discovering this. So how many years did that go on unchecked? This one down here, when I talk to the Pine Richland students tomorrow, I'll be making them all stand up, take deep breaths, shake things out, and pay attention to this last line because if they remember nothing else, this is the one that I want them to remember. Because when I sat and I listened to the D.A.R.E. talks and I listened to the, you know, the, the auditoriums like this, this is the one thing that I just couldn't grasp. Why would anybody do heroin? If we know how bad it is and we know how dangerous it is and we see what happens to people when they're on heroin, who in their right mind would ever do that first dose? It doesn't work that way. Nobody, almost nobody, comes out and says, hey, let's try some heroin. What could go wrong? They don't say that. It starts 94% of the time, it starts with pills. It starts with a Norco, it starts with a Percocet, it starts with Tylenol with Cody. And why? Well, because Uncle Tim takes it for his knee, he's doing okay. Grandma took it after her back surgery, she's doing okay. So there's a perception of less risk. There's a perception that this isn't as harmful. But slowly over time, they will progress from those pills to heroin. Why? Why does somebody progress from a Percocet to heroin? You know, this was something else that I really didn't understand. But it happens so commonly. Even the most conservative studies, I say 94%, the most conservative study that I was able to find said 82%. But we know that the majority of people are starting off with pain pills before progressing to heroin. This is the reason why that progression happens. Okay, if you look at the top slide, this is morphine, this is heroin, and this is codeine. And from far away and at first glance, you can barely tell the difference between those molecules. The only difference is this little carboxyl group at the top. That shows you that your body is breaking this down to the same molecule, essentially. It's binding the same receptor in your brain. You have various opiate receptors. The OR1 receptor is the one that is at cause for addiction. That's what gives you the euphoria. This little carboxyl group determines the level of potency, but they're essentially all getting broken down to the same thing, where your body doesn't essentially know the difference. You combine that with this other phenomenon, which is opioid tolerance, and that's why people progress down that pathway. And the best way I can prescribe, describe opiate tolerance to you is, say you did have that accident, you did shatter your femur, you came to the ER. We knew it was gonna be a long road to recovery, okay? We give you Percocets. And at first, you take a Percocet and you think like, wow, my pain is actually a little bit better. I can get up and walk across the room. I, I, I can function. This is great. What opiate tolerance says is that down the road, maybe it may be three or four months, it may be a year, but instead of one Percocet to get that pain control effect, it's gonna take two Percocets to give you that same pain control effect. Another year or two, it might take three Percocets. But what ends up happening is people get to the point where it takes three or four Percocets to give you that same level of pain control or that same level of euphoria but you need one Percocet just to get out of bed, just to not be sick. And so that's how the progression happens. And almost every addict will tell you, the progression is not something that they want to do. It's not something that they plan for. It's an economical choice. They get to the point where, you know, if they're buying seven or eight Percocets a day, that might be $80 a day, depending on the neighborhood you live in. If they get to the point where it's $100 a day and a friend comes up and says, hey, you can take this instead. Stamp bags are down to $7 a bag. You can take this stamp bag 
And don't worry, you don't have to inject it. You don't have to be like the dirty drug addicts that injects drugs. You can just snort a little bit. You'll be able to get out of bed, you'll be able to, to do your normal routine, go to work. You just snort a tiny little bit. Oh, and by the way, instead of $100 a day, this seven bucks will get you through the whole week. Well, of course that sounds appealing. They've already drained their bank accounts. They've already, there have already been red flags popping up. Where did this money go? Where did that money go? Well, now $7 a whole week, all of a sudden, that looks manageable. And then they have the illusion of control. Okay, I'm going to snort this little bit of heroin, but over time, I'm gonna cut my dose, I'm gonna wait until the timing is right to go to rehab. Whatever their illusion of control is, that same progression down that pathway continues. Where the line is where they say, I'll snort it and I won't inject it, that's okay for now. But again, as that tolerance continues to develop, that line gets pushed further too. I put this slide up mainly for you know, the kids that I talk to because they, they like it. But it was a question that I always had. You know, when you know somebody who's struggling with addiction and you don't see them for a long period of time, it's almost like they're, they're a completely different person when you do see them. Now we know now from this that their limbic system has been taken over by this, these opioids. And you also know that any addict that is far enough down that pathway, they will forego all of these things. They will forego food, water, sex, and shelter. They will give up their family, their job. They will let all of those things fall to the wayside to the point where they're not eating. And they look like a shadow of who they were before. They look like a skeleton. You know, but the question I always had was why the behavior changes? Why are they doing things that are, it can't just be chemistry, right? It can't just be an abnormal dopamine level. There has to be more to it. We know now that there is. There's something called neuroplasticity. Some of you may have heard of neuroplasticity, if you've ever heard of the online games, Luminosity, or any of those training type programs, training for your brain. We're gonna make you better at memory recall. We're gonna make you better at crossword puzzles. We're gonna make you better at remembering names and, and your sales job. You know, but it's the idea behind practice makes perfect, right? Yeah, your muscles will get fine tuned, but we can make your brain sharper. We can make you better at chess. That's what neuroplasticity is. The best way I can describe neuroplasticity is by giving you an example. So say you just experienced something enjoyable. We'll use uh, walking outside and, and, and the sun hits your face and a warm breeze on your back. It feels good, right? You stop, the sun hits your face, and, ah, this feels amazing. And immediately, you know that that's dopamine, right? Because dopamine is the drug in your brain that you produce naturally that is the feel-good chemical. Well, in addition to getting a little squirt of dopamine into your brain when that sun hits your face, there is an actual structural change that occurs. And it's very, very tiny. It's very, very small. And it may be out of the, the billions and billions of neurons that you have in your brain, it may be one subtle change of this neuron pulling back a connection from neuron A and sending one out to neuron B. But there is a change in your brain. Now that change is designed to push you towards that activity again. Maybe I'll take a break tomorrow when it's sunny out. Maybe I'll take a break every day at this time because that felt good. But over time, those changes add up. You know, we like to think of our body as like a static thing, but it's not, it's constantly changing. Even your bones. You think your bone is rigid? If you put your bone in a brace for six months, it will bend. Because your body is constantly laying down new cells and taking out old cells when it comes to the bones. When it comes to the brain, it's not laying down neurons and killing old neurons, but there are structural changes. You know what that also means is that if I took one of you and I took you into the lab and I scanned your brain and I said, this neuronal mapping, this is you. This is what makes you who you are. It makes you like the things you like. It makes you have the, the motivation that you have, your mood levels, all the things that make you you. They're dependent on your personality. That is your neuronal map. 
If I then send you out there into the world, and I bring you back two weeks later, and I rescan you, those maps are going to look slightly different. What determines those changes is dependent on what you were exposed to. Did you go home and, and get a, a job raise and win the lottery and have the best week of your life? Or did your best friend die, your mom got cancer, your dog got hit by a car? I mean, that, that, that's, that's me being dramatic. But the truth is, is the stronger the emotion, the more likely the change. Now imagine an opiate addict. Imagine an opiate addict who's putting an opiate into their brain. They're getting a dopamine wave unlike anything that you can imagine achieving naturally. Their brain is making subtle changes to drive them towards that behavior again and again and again. Now imagine you put that opiate into your system three times that day. What about every day for a month? About every month for a year? So on and so forth. You get it, right? Over long periods of time, you are dealing with neuroplasticity and changes that then dictate the behavior of that person. This is also why you can't fix this in 30 days. You can't come to the addiction clinic and say, okay, well, you know, I've been an addict for 10 years. Uh, you know, 30 days, I want to be off these meds, I want to be back to normal. You know, it doesn't work like that. You can't send your loved one to Passages Malibu and, and get your 17-year-old daughter back. You can certainly embrace all of those things and, and do everything you can, and for some people it will work. But does anybody know what the statistics are, the, the success rate of a 30-day program like Passages Malibu? Success rate is 3%. So 97% of them will go straight back to drugs. But they don't tell you that because it's a business because it's a multi-million dollar industry. So these things don't get talked about very much, but if you actually want to em embrace a life of recovery and, and abstinence from drugs, it's a very long commitment. You have to work back towards moving that neuroplasticity in the other direction. This was a big misconception that I had. I would always tell my mother, let's just lock my brother in the basement. We'll keep him in there for 30 days, we'll feed him under the door, I saw it on TV, I bet it'll work. Doesn't work, right? We know this from numerous studies. We know it from the success rates of these businesses. We know it from people that are incarcerated and, and return to drugs. This is part of the reason why we will never arrest our way out of this problem. You can't fix that in 30 days. I also put these pictures up there for two reasons. This top one, it's a rusty factory that, you know, the chains are, 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 are locked up and, and rusted. When you think about an opiate addict, the other thing, especially when you're talking about heroin, there's something very important to understand. You have these opioid receptors in your brain, not so that humans could discover opiates, not so that we could discover heroin. You have them because you have natural opiates that you produce. Well, anybody who knows about medicine will, will see a common theme with many things. When you start supplying something from an outside source, meaning exogenously, versus something that you make within your own body, which is endogenously, when you're supplying it exogenously, your own production of it shuts down. This is why somebody who is abusing steroids or, or even just getting regular testosterone injections, their body stops producing testosterone. Well, when you are supplying dopamine surges and you're supplying these happiness chemicals via an exogenous route, your own internal factory shuts down. And if you've ever seen an addict who's in the acute stages of withdrawal, you've seen this. They are the most sad, pathetic, unmotivated, it's hard to see. They're often suicidal. They're often saying things like, I can't do this, just kill me. Because the parts of their brain that have to do with motivation and hope and happiness, there are no chemicals being produced. 
It has shut down because of that exogenous use. You are literally dealing with an empty gas tank. So even if you get people through those physical symptoms, those like first seven or eight days of opiate withdrawal, that doesn't fix the neuroplasticity. It doesn't correct their dopamine and serotonin levels. So hopefully that helps you see how much work there is to do when you're trying to get somebody clean off of opiates. So I've just got a couple more slides. How did we get this far? How about healthcare? Does anybody think that it was the doctors? I know doctors that will prescribe 30 Percocets for sunburn. Do you think those doctors contributed to the problem? For sure. And there's been a lack of education and a lack of awareness when dealing with opioids. That has certainly contributed to the problem. How about government? Do you think government had anything to do with it? The government came up with something in the late 90s that sounded like a great idea. The Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, which is the big government um, group that decides Medicare reimbursement and Medicaid reimbursement, they decided to tie patient satisfaction scores to physician reimbursement. So in other words, you get paid if your patients are happy. And that sounds like a good idea, right? Like, oh, let's, let's keep our doctors accountable. Let's keep them you know, making us happy. I don't like waiting in the room for 40 minutes until he sees me like, I. it sounds like a great idea, but it has unwanted consequences. You now have less and less time to make that patient happy. You had 30 minutes, now you have 20, now you have 15. And we say 15, we meant 12. Yeah, you better cut that to eight. How are you gonna make that patient happy? With a prescription pad. So is it any wonder that we had opioids just being dished out? Well, my Uncle Tim takes Norco and his back doesn't hurt anymore. Okay. But is it also any wonder that we have an antibiotic epidemic? Everybody gets antibiotics for viral illnesses and now we have super resistant organisms. Is it any wonder that we have an SSRI epidemic? How many people have been prescribed an SSRI? Probably 50% of people in the room. Is it any wonder that we have an Adderall and Ritalin epidemic? We have a prescribing epidemic because of this make the patient happy. What's medically responsible went out the window. Making a person happy became the top priority, and if you tie money to it, you're gonna see an effect. How about Big Pharma? Anybody think the pharmaceutical companies had anything to do with it? You know, that was maybe a surprise to people maybe a year or two ago, but most of you now have seen either the 60 Minutes coverage or your local news coverage about the, the appalling things that some of these pharmaceutical companies have done. They have even fudged data, made things look less addictive than they are. And those pharmaceutical companies are still in operation. They're still making your drugs. They got a little slap on the wrist, a little fine, and then it's business as usual. Capitalism, you can come up with a dozen ways in which you know, that has contributed. But what about us? What about as, as people here in Pine Richland, do we bear any responsibility? I can tell you that we're bearing the consequences. No matter who you are, what walk of life you are, you are bearing the consequences of this opioid epidemic. And I've been trying to, to educate people on this for over a decade now. But I see it every day in the emergency department. If you come in and you're having a brainstem stroke or you're having a thoracic aortic aneurysm, and I need to get you from point A to point B, but all the ambulances are out responding to overdoses, you just paid the price of this opioid epidemic. If your health insurance has gone up and up and up because of all the unintended costs that come with this opioid epidemic, you are bearing the weight of the, the the epidemic. So we're all bearing the weight of the epidemic. But do we share any blame? You know, as a father, I, I'm just as guilty of this as anybody. I don't want to see my kids sad. I don't want to see my kid hurt. You know, but what happens whenever we protect them too much and then they get out there in the world and they experience real pain? Because the corporate world doesn't care about their feelings and doesn't have a safe place for them to go to. What about this cultural phenomenon of we just want a quick fix? We want a quick fix to everything. 
hey doc, my uncle died, I don't really have time for this grieving stuff, and no, I didn't go to counseling, I don't have time for that either. You gotta give me something that's gonna make me feel better. How often do you think I hear that? Hey doc, my knee hurts, I don't have time for this, I gotta work. You gotta give me something, make it go away. You know, when we think about it, probably between 60 and 70% of the answer to your problem when it comes to your health, probably I'd say 60 to 70% of the time, the answer is diet, exercise, and lifestyle changes. My back hurts, my sugar's too high, my blood pressure's too high, my knees hurt. Diet, exercise, lifestyle changes would work in probably 60% of those cases. But we're, we have that cultural phenomenon. I don't have time for that. We also have that cultural phenomenon of doctors got to make the patient happy. So that plays into that as well. You know, but we need to really look at the consequences that come with those kind of things because the opioid epidemic is one of them. So back to this slide before I wrap things up. One of the things that I found is when you ask healthcare professionals, 80% of them will say it's a disease. It's abnormal neurophysiology, it's abnormal neurochemistry, it's all the things we talked about, that's the definition of a disease. When I ask addicts, they say, well, I just make bad choices, man. Because they're not aware of those things that are happening in their brain. But one of the things that I find very interesting is people who don't want to call it a disease, they think that calling it a disease is removing accountability. They think that calling it a disease is like saying to the addict, ah, oh, you've got a disease, you couldn't help it. That's not what calling it a disease is saying. Calling it a disease is no difference than calling this guy's lungs a disease or this guy's plaques in his arteries a disease. Do you think when this guy comes to the emergency department, and we've all seen these guys, right? Like they're, they're, they're walking around with a combustible gas flowing around their face and they're putting a lighted torch an inch from it. We've all seen it, right? Sometimes their house blows up and it ends up on the news. But do you think when he comes in and says, Dr. Brophy, I, I can't breathe. Do you think that I'd say, well, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't keep smoking. We've been telling you for 20 years that cigarettes are bad for you, but you keep making that bad decision. So no, no oxygen for you, buddy. Of course not, right? I would never do that. I wouldn't be a, a physician, let alone a, a compassionate human being. What about this guy? Shoveling food in every day. Weight's out of control, has a coronary artery. Do you think that one of the questions on the stent questionnaire is, did he stop eating McDonald's when you told him to? No, of course not. But we treat addicts that way. We treat opioid addicts that way. We, we see it as a moral failing. We see it as something they should just stop doing. They need a slap upside the head. They need a good talking to from Uncle Joe. But hopefully you understand a little bit about now why that doesn't work so well. And it's the same situation in these. It's a choice that led to a disease process. And the further you go down that pathway, the more the disease progresses and the harder it is to get back to square one. So just some take home points. Addiction, when you see an addict, try not to think of it as a moral failure. It's an imbalance of neurochemistry and it's abnormal neurophysiology. Once that first dose starts, the brain changes begin. And this is something that I spend a lot of time with tomorrow when I'm talking to the students. Because that illicit drug use here and there, I'm just having fun, that does have consequences. Prevention and education should be a primary focus because even though, you know, we have figured out some statistics for treatment that are a little bit better than the 3% from like a passages Malibu, none of them are ideal. I'll give you an example, methadone. Methadone has a success rate of about 32%. It means 32% of those people one year later will only be taking methadone and not be taking other opiates. 32% doesn't sound that great, right? It's a third. But compared to 3%, that's 10 times better. 
And this is why with the government, with their spending, you're seeing them support those kinds of programs, medication-assisted treatment stuff. Because even if we're only getting success rates of 30 to 50%, it's way better than the 3% that we're seeing with the jail, 30-day abstinence-based programs, all those kind of things. And lastly, if we reduce addiction, everyone's life improves. As a physician, if there's less addiction out there, it makes it easier to care for everybody. As people that are out there in the community, you know, it, 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 if an addict falls asleep at the wheel and, and hits one of your loved ones, that's going to affect your life forever. So if we all open our minds and open our hearts a little bit and, and compassionately address this addiction issue and do whatever we have to do to make it better, everybody's life improves.